welcome to this episode of The Loins of History. My name is Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host, Colin. This is a podcast about connecting current events to history, and we're continuing in our next episode on a history of U.S. and Chinese relations. Last week, we covered how the CCP, or the Communist Chinese Party, was just making everyone very upset in the international world, (laughs) to include the United States and, as we saw, Russia and even India. And now this week, we're going to focus on internal Chinese considerations, kind of going through the 60s and 70s, talking about the lead up to the Cultural Revolution. So, Colin, what are our key takeaways this week? Well, just to make sure they didn't leave anybody out. So, they were pissing everybody off outside, and now they're going to make everybody upset in, inside their country. So, that's right. Great job, Mal. <laughs> yeah, well, this. And yeah, that's a great point. We're going to see it's not all Mao. He definitely is the architect behind a lot of this, but some of his, the party chair, you know, the other party heads within the CCP are going to lead this movement right now, leading up to the Cultural Revolution. So the key takeaways we need to be cognizant of this episode. So we're going to be focusing internally. We just left uh, looking back at the Great Leap Forward, and we left off that episode on the 7,000 cadres conference. And that was the political low point of Mao. So we, we need to keep that in mind. Like he is coming out of a, an absolute low, internally speaking. So there's borderline rebellion within the CCP against Mao at this point. Mao also believes, as Mao is the absolute ideological center point of the CCP's Leninist thought. He is a true believer, and he believed that the socialist fervor or vitality, it was dying off. Rightfully so, after the Great Leap Forward, as we mentioned, that there was tens of millions of people that starved to death because of his policies. And we'll get into this further. There is a lot of reason to believe that that fervor was dying out, if not being completely reversed. With that being said, there came a new scapegoat for Mao and the CCP, and those were revisionists and rightists. So obviously, we talked about the secret speech with Khrushchev, and the KMT was obviously always a factor being in the being in Taiwan, just across the Taiwan Strait. But because of the failings of the Great Leap Forward, someone had to be blamed. And we'll see that a shadow economy actually emerged during this time period. And they were the ones scapegoated as not all in on socialism. They even called them roaders or because they wanted to take the capitalist road. So these revisionists of socialism, these rightists. What's a shadow economy? That is a very good question. So a shadow economy is something that forms that is we call it typically like the black market. So it's something that forms because people are unable to uh, have access to the goods and services that they want through legitimate means. So in the shadow economy, like this one, people weren't able to get food. So they found ways around around that of farming, shipping, buying, and selling from the government at low cost. Corruption would reign, was rampant. So they would take corrupt officials and ship food around and make profit. This comes into play pretty heavily during the socialist education movement during these investigations. But a shadow economy operated outside of the recorded you know, the economic records. So like we talked about Mm. in the Great Leap Forward episode, the GDP fell by 30%, so much so that China um, up until this point had been a net exporter of grain. China is a massive country and they were very agrarian. So one would think that they would have a strong um, net export of grain. During the Great Leap Forward, they actually became a net importer. Um, But with that being said, the shadow economy operated so people were still able to get access to grain. So Mm. even though it wasn't being recorded, on paper, it was still existing off the books. That's a long way is, to say the black market. Is that why the F in communism stands for food? Because it's not there. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great, that's a good joke. That's a good anti-communist joke. It, yeah, we're, you know what, it, it, a little sidebar here on the key takeaways, but you know, the Great Leap Forward was such a dramatic failure. We'll see this later with some of the falling out, but like Liu Shaoqi, who is the vice chairman of the CCP in the heir apparent to Mao. I believe it was the summer of 1962. They even got into like a shouting match. They were both being very belligerent with one another, which if you think about it, Mao had millions of people killed and lots of people had died. Mao was incredibly politically savvy and had a lot of allies everywhere. To challenge him that openly and belligerently could mean death and a very painful death and a very- It was a bold move. It was a bold move, but that's how bad it got. And that's how much a lot of his cabinet disagreed with him. Eventually, they kind of calmed down 
But like that was just one episode where his number two and his heir apparent absolutely called him out. And it was like at a resort and he just came up to him and Matt was <laughs> sitting by the water just hanging out. And they just got into a belligerent shouting match. Anyway, and then the final key takeaway, the socialist education movement or campaign, as it's also known, became the precursor, the true precursor to the Cultural Revolution. And this was a movement that was actually, it was okayed by Mao, but it was headed up by Liu Shaoqi. And this was like his, I kind of think of it as almost like his baby. It was like his test run at being the chairman of the CCP. And we'll see why. And it ultimately led to him falling out of favor with Mao. And dying under mysterious circumstances a few years later. As did, did he also the- fall out of a window later? <laughs> I don't know if he was that close to Putin, but uh, yeah. he <laughs> he did die I think in 1969. I mean he was age 70, but you know, it was 4 years after falling out of favor in 1965 after the socialist education movement didn't really meet Mao's expectations of what he wanted. We'll get to that in a second. So, just to go back Mao's political power coming out of the 7,000 Cadres Conference at its all-time low. Socialist fervor was dying out. Revisionists and rightists became the new scapegoats. And the socialist education movement was beginning. It was going to be the precursor to the Cultural Revolution. All right. So let's start with the Mao's political power being at its at its nadir. Coming out of the 7,000 Cadres Conference, if you remember the episode, we talked about this during the Great Leap Forward. There was this really Chinese episode at the conference where everyone kind of admitted that they had some element of fault to include Mao. Mao even came up there and so like more or less said, the buck stops with me. You know, I'm the leader. This is, it's on me. And then everyone else came forward and said, well, but Chairman Mao, we gave you the wrong information. We did all these things because we believed so much in what was happening and we were derailed for all these other reasons. And I think they ended up assigning like 30% blame to the weather, natural phenomenon, 70% was man-made. But there was still wait, a wait, lot wait, of people. Wait, 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 They blamed the weather? I can, now, to, 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 no, wait, to that point, no, there's, there was. There's, a, there's some irony here. <laughs> because going on right now, there's a bunch of weather balloons getting shot down. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> that, well, sorry, they're not weather balloons, folks. but. The CCP is claiming that they're weather balloons, and they're saying they got blown off course by the weather. I'm noticing a historical trend. <laughs> the only, they're only 30% the weather. weather balloons. They only do 30%. 30% of the recon is what weather related. But yeah. it is interesting hearing that in that episode where he, in that, in that, you know, kind of, we're all apologizing, but we're not really blaming Mao. In that, there's still a lot of dissent. Because leading up to it, there were people there that were ready to challenge Mao and outright throw him out. It didn't happen, and they kind of stepped back. But Zhao Enlai, who is the premier of the Communist Party, Liu Liu Shaoqi, who is the vice chairman of the CCP, and Deng Xiaoping, who was the general secretary of the CCP, they basically sidelined Mao. Mao even has stepped back and became a philosophical and ideological leader of the CCP and communism as a whole. And it kind of gave him a moment to begin writing, theorizing about Leninism and Marxism and sort of becoming this like spiritual, and I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but he steps back from the day. What I'm trying to say is he steps back from the day-to-day decisions of like, hey, we're going to we're going to create all these quotas for people and how much grain they should produce. And we're going to go and beat them if they don't meet these quotas. Like he did, he wasn't making those calls. He steps back, he begins writing, he begins theorizing. Mao, Mao thought comes back, and we'll get to that in a second. But these other members of the party were making decisions, and they're the ones that actually head up the socialist education movement coming later. So he's kind of on the outs a little bit, and he has to regain some favor internally at the party. So within the socialist fervor that was dying down, during the Great Leap Forward, the shadow economy that was created, it's pretty incredible if you think about like millions of people were dying from starvation. And I think there was a quote that I read where, I wish I could remember, I wrote it down, but this Chinese man was being interviewed and he basically came out and said that if you didn't steal food, you died. That's how bad it was. And then the people that didn't have to steal that somehow survived were becoming profiteers in the shadow economy. During the investigations that were later found, I think they said there was up to 20,000, quote, profiteers that were operating in Wuhan. And what they were doing was they were bribing corrupt officials to uh, create false accounting practices, cook- cooking the books, if you will. You've heard that, having double bookkeeping. 
they would be they would buy government grant or they would buy grain from the government at the fixed rate from the government and then they would sell it on the black market for a profit. There were reports in South China that they were using the the airlines basically to smuggle food all throughout China, like completely off the books and sell it. There were people that were operating small farms that were selling things that was highly illegal at this time. If you remember, they created these large communes and nobody had land. They had communal kitchens. Nobody had anything. These were still happening. And they estimated that a third of the country was doing this in profiteering, which was a huge no-no, absolutely against communism and Leninism. On top of these people profiteering, they were also kind of taking a step back culturally and not a back like going backwards in time, but in a sense, yes, they were stepping away from communism. Mao tried to do away with a lot of the fundamental historical Chinese uh, cultural aspects. He called it feudalistic, old, things like that. But a lot of the marriage practices came back that were uh, done away with once they took power in the 1949. Christianity and Buddhism were actually on the rise. Despite being heavily persecuted by the Chinese government, temples and churches were being built all over the country, not just in the rural countryside, but they were meeting in secret all over the country. And this was happening everywhere, like I said, across the country. So a third of the country was profiteering, becoming more religious and more, quote, feudal, where people were operating just, and they didn't care. That was part of the problem. Most of them assumed that they were going to die, that either they were going to starve to death or the Communist Party was going to put them to death. So they didn't really care. They just did it. So how did Mao, Mao, a lot of the problem that Mao needed to address was how do we reignite this fervor? Liu Shaoqi's method and decision was the socialist education movement. And so talk about this in a second. The revisionists and rightists were the ones that from this shadow economy and this fervor that was being pushed and kind of reinvigorated this revival, if you will, Mao called them rightists so the, or, or revisionists. So if we remember from the secret speech, Khrushchev was considered a revisionist. He wanted to change what Leninism was. He was very pragmatical in the way that he approached the USSR economy to the point that he actually decollectivized. He allowed people to make money on the side. He allowed private economy and private enterprise to occur within the Soviet Union, and Mao hated that. He also worked with the United States to de-arm, to de-escalate situations. And again, that was a no-go for Mao because he would be – that is um, – he, I think he at one point said that the USSR is only a few steps away from becoming a capitalist country. Hmm. Internally, that's what he believed was occurring with his own CCP party members. Not so much maybe his inner circle, but definitely on the lower uh, rungs of the CCP ladder. And so he looked to Stalin kind of as inspiration. We talked at length before that they were very similar. And Stalin wrote a book uh, called The Short Courses where he uh, – basically called out the entire party in the USSR, the Communist Party within the USSR, and said that the fight does not end now. And I'm going to read a quick quote from that. As we grow stronger, the enemy will become tamer and more inoffensive. That is false. In reality, the exact opposite is happening. And this, is called, this has called for vigilance, real Bolshe Bolshevik revolutionary vigilance. The enemy was no longer out there, but hiding in plain sight inside the very ranks of the party. The reason he said this is because he feared that within the Chinese Communist Party, with this socialist fervor dying out or lagging in this revival of old ways of thinking and capitalism, that now his enemies were no longer, his primary enemies were no longer external, but internal to his party. And he needed so to figure out a way to solve that. Sorry, go ahead. Mao, Mao said that, not Stalin? That's that's from the short courses. That is Stalin's oh, Stalin words. said that. Yes, but Mao looked to that and began publishing mm. amongst his party and encouraging them to read it because that's what he believed. Actually, so at the 10th plenum, this was in 1962, September of 1962, as a matter of fact, this is where they initially started the socialist education movement. And came up with the four cleanups. But during the speech, he came up with a few, few problems. And so here's a quote. And Mao says, after the victory of the revolution, because of the existence of the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie internationally, because of the existence of the bourgeoisie remnants internally, because of the petite bourgeoisie exists and continually generates a bourgeoisie, therefore the classes which have been overthrown within the country will continue to exist for a long time to come and may even attempt restoration. He goes on to rail on um, internal potential enemies, and it's a pretty long, 
speech that he gives. He even goes after the arts and novels and and we'll get to that in a second. But you can see there that his primary fear at this point now was shifting away from this external enemy of the KMT where they're shooting bullets at each other to internally the party and who's going to attempt to revise Stalinism. And I think part of his fear in the, you know, we talked about that, uh, that blow up argument that he and uh, Liu Shukai, Shao Chi, excuse me, had at the end of it, Mao said, you know, what'll happen? I'm paraphrasing, but it was like, what'll happen after we're dead? Like, so he was very concerned with his legacy and the legacy of, of socialism. So moving forward. In that same conference, the, the, 10th, the 10th party plenum, there was four cleanups that were announced. So to fix this, we have revisionists running wild in the CCP. Socialist fervor is at a low. Mao is reconsolidating power kind of behind the scenes while his um, lieutenants, for lack of a better word, start administering this process to clean up things. The four cleanups. So they deal economic, political, organizational, and ideological. So these were what they needed to clean up in order to fix the Socialist Party in the wake of uh, the Great Leap Forward and the fallout of that. And so they were uh, cleaning up formalism, bureaucratism, hedonism, extravagance, and they wanted basically to curve corruption. So I think they found during a lot of these investigations that like 80% of officials throughout the country had been corrupt and had partaken in corrupt activities, like we said, cooking the books, profiteering, things like that, cleaning up the style of work to improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the party's work by streamlining procedures. Basically, they realized that this massive communes that they set up, the quota system, these backyard furnaces that were producing pig iron were no good. So they needed to fix the way that they went about uh, doing business and making decisions politically. Cleaning up the party's excuse me, cleaning up the party's political life, and they wanted to enhance the political consciousness and discipline of each of the party members. And I think this was kind of Mao's shot at saying like, we need to toe a hard socialist Leninist line here, and then. Cleaning up the party's organization. <clears throat> Obviously, the CCP at this point was very much bloated. Thinking back to the long march, like there were some key leaders in positions, but they were very small. They were very agile and able to make decisions. That had kind of always been their strength. Now they're this massive bloated party and they were just inefficient and corrupt. So they wanted to clean that up. So that was what Li- Liu Shaoqi was charged with at that point to move forward with the four, excuse me, the socialist. Uh, education movement. And those were a series of campaigns to do those four cleanups. So following this 10th party plenum in 1962, there in February of 1963, there was a leadership conference. And this is where the early 10 points were published by Mao. And this was kind of his guidelines for how the CCP should be governed and how these principles should guide the daily life of members of the CCP. And I think it's really for not just the members of the CCP, but also the peasants as well. So they were unity, democracy, criticism, and self-criticism. And that's key because it comes into play, especially during the Cultural Revolution, this idea that everyone can be critical and, quote, criticize each other. And it kind of gets out of hand during the Cultural Revolution. But as we're saying, as we said, this is the the ground floor. This is the the precursor to that. Discipline, living frugally. And this is kind of an interesting point because we'll see once Lin Biao starts working with the military, living frugally was kind of this egalitarian, every man is in the same position, the same fight. Like in their military uniforms at the time, they got rid of all rank and medals. Everyone wore the same uniforms. That's why when you see Chairman Mao and pictures of him, he's dressed so plainly because he's not supposed to look like this grand leader. He is. And there's some very... um, there's some very deliberate ways that they make him portray him, but he is still supposed to be seen as a common man. He's obviously not. Somehow he always stands above, but he's still supposed to be the common man standing above. That's key there. But in the military, generals, everyone wore the same uniforms. And that was supposed to not just be in the military, but everywhere. Um, and we'll yeah, see I was this. Looking in, I was looking, I know you're going to get into this before the end of the episode, but I was looking at pictures of the Gang of Four. And they're literally all wearing the exact same thing. And that same like outfit is the same thing that Mao would wear. They look like janitors. It's ridiculous. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's kind of funny because it's almost that we're looking at 
totalitarian regimes and this cult of personality, this larger than life. And you see a lot of dictators, they wear ridiculous uniforms. They have so many medals. You're like, what are you? You look ridiculous. You look like a clown, but they love it. But it's like the exact opposite of what Mao was and what he wanted. Devotion to public duty, honesty and integrity, diligence and hard work, respect and knowledge and education, courage to reform. Again, that's going to be key, courage to reform, especially for the young, for the younger generation. Now, those are going to be revised two times. So, Deng Xiaoping is going to come out with a later 10 points, which is going to essentially call for the urban intellectuals and young people to move out into the countryside and participate in the work and inspire them at the same time, root out any subversive attitudes and kind of reform them as well. I heard one term, I was listening, this college professor was talking about it online and he was like, yeah, it was kind of like a mentorship type thing. That's sort of how they perceived it. And I was like, oof, it was, they did not do a very good job mentoring because like 77,000 people ended up dying during this. But that was kind of the, I think the initial, initial intent maybe in Mao's mind and Deng Xiaoping is like, yeah, these, these intellectuals are going to move from the city and they're going to go to the countryside. They're going to work side by side with the peasants and they're going to kind of reform them. They're going to stamp out this backwards feudalistic thinking that they have. And mind you, some of it was feudalistic. Like from what I understand and was reading, some of the statistics show that like out of wedlock births were on the rise. Opium was being done kind of without, you know, openly a borderline in some of these areas where they thought that would be extreme. Like one of the cities where one of the stops along the way during the long march, like was a very key like city for the communist party. Like they were doing opium like in the streets. So like that's how bad it got. So they were like, well, we'll, we'll send these intellectuals and these people who really buy into the party, we'll send them out to the countryside to monitor, to mentor them. So this kind of top down idea. And then later, um, Liu Shaoqi, he's going to release the revised later 10 points. And in those revised later 10 points, that is going to give the authority and opportunity for people to or CCP officials to investigate peasants' complaints. So if a peasant complained on somebody who was a member of the CCP or a cadre member or an official, they could complain and that had to be investigated. See, that comes in later. So it's an important point. I do want to mention... With Liu Shaoqi and Mao, I kind of alluded to it, and I, you know, I said that they had that big argument. They, you know, he was his number two, but fundamentally they operated very differently, and I think they believed different things. Liu Shaoqi was very much a pragmatist, and the more I read on on and study him, I see like his ideals here were, uh, and part of the things that got him really upset about the Great Leap Forward was how the death toll that it took, and realizing how badly it failed. He really did take a look at what was going on in the country and was very upset and troubled by it and did not want to do that again at all. Whereas Mao, Mao was a true believer in Leninism and communism. And frankly, he, he seemed very willing to sacrifice tens of millions of people on the altar of that belief. Once Liu Shaoqi was officially named successor to Mao in 1961, and he was in charge of the economic recovery from the Great Leap Forward, the economy actually turned around a little bit. I think grain ex- or grain production rose like 50 million tons or so uh, pretty dramatically. So he actually did turn the economy around quite a bit. And he, you know, we, there was massive communes with thousands of different Chinese members of peasant, the Chinese peasants He shrank them down to like the first five-year plan where they were just smaller collectives. They were still, I think, called communes, but they were much smaller. The villagers and peasants were allowed to have small plots of land that they could farm themselves for their own subsistence and eating. They were also allowed to make crafts in order to supplement their income. So they were given some reign and authority. So you can see that he kind of backed away from pure communism and said, it doesn't work. We're going to go a little slower here, and this needs to be done to save people's lives. Got him in a lot of trouble later. But that's kind of what you need to have in mind as he's heading up this socialist education campaign and movement over the next three years. That's how that's his idealism. It almost makes me. Hey, go ahead. It almost makes me wonder like, surely Mao saw how poorly the Great Leap Forward 
fared, right? Like, it sounds like all these other guys, they they looked at the Great Leap Forward and they're like, man, this that was not good. Uh, so how do we... How do we still modernize and get Mao out of the way? But again, keeping in mind that this is all just a precursor to the Cultural Revolution, like they were lar- like they were unsuccessful, right? And and Mao like got even worse. And I, it's just making me wonder, like, what kind of person like was Mao? Like, what kind of person was someone so like willfully? Blind to the negative impacts he was causing on his country. This is a bold statement, but he was not a good person. He was like downright evil. And like, here's what I mean by that. Obviously, he killed tens of millions of people. And I mean, from reading these accounts, it's not like he was, he didn't mourn. It's not like he was like, he stepped away from just, he just stepped away from making decisions. It's not like he, threw himself on the feet of his people to uh, for forgiveness. He kind of gave a half-hearted apology. And, but then if you look at his personal life, he was married for divorces happen, I'm not this isn't a statement on that, but he was married four times and he was a notorious womanizer. I think it was he would just have strings of women. He would basically point out women that he wanted to sleep with. And he just he had like 10 kids, probably way more. But he would just he had numerous affairs on his wives. He was you got to think a man in his position with some Chinese woman he finds attractive, that's very predatorial. Like you, you add up all those things like that he was willing to have people killed in his party under very mysterious circumstances. Millions of people died and he really didn't want to make changes. He would infuse chaos into his country in order to further his ideals. And then right. like in his personal life, he just didn't care. Like, I mean, he just, whatever, just, just another wife, just another mistress, yeah. you know, you just kind of string along. So reading all that, I, it's not like he was, Hey, I was just making bad decisions and I was a victim of my times. It was like, no, I'm just not a good no. person. I I can't help but think the most dangerous character trait a leader can have is arrogance. And when you just like pick out women and want to sleep around with them. When you feel like you have this like divine mission to, to go and do these things and let the consequences be damned type deal. When you don't listen to literally all of your advisors telling you to do X, but you think Y is the best way to go forward. Like that all just screams ego, uh, unchecked, unabated arrogance. And you know, thinking about Hitler, Hitler was the same way. Stalin was the same way. Uh, Pol Pot. Not even like Pol Pot. Yeah. Like, and not even like the leaders of the country, like the worst bosses I've ever had were a bunch of egotistical jerks, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it's like, like, you know, we talked about the mandate of heaven and people like, well, he's the emperor. He has this mandate of heaven. The man generally, like the mandate of heaven was not officially sanctioned. They didn't proclaim it, but he was he was born during the Qing the Qing dynasty. He was he was involved in the the Xinhai revolution. Like he remembers the, that part of Chinese culture and history. He believed that he every bit deserved this, and he was part of it. Like so, yes, that point about an ego. Like he believed his own cult of personality one hundred percent. That's my personal take on reading all of these things and just looking at his life as a whole, especially once he comes to real power in China, you know, after 1949, once he starts making, he's not just fighting as the resistance. He is the supreme leader, the chairman of the party. Yes. He's just a bad guy. There's no, no other way to put it. Like tens of millions of people. I think I saw the latest estimate I saw was like 40 to 60 million people died during his time as chairman of the communist party, 40 to 60 million people. That isn't, we can't even fathom that in the United States. So yes, he was a bad guy. and there's no other way around it. I think some of his party, like you read about Liu Shaoqi, um, Deng Xiaoping, and like we'll see later once we get on to a lot of those, like Deng Xiaoping, excuse me, Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping. In the 80s, they look back at the Cultural Revolution and they see all of the people who were falsely accused. They had to go through these struggle sessions who were either killed or dishonored, they exonerated them because they looked back on it and made official statements and said, that was bad. We did. That was terrible what we did. And the Cultural Revolution lasted till 1976. 
So it was not a two-year thing like the great leap forward. It was 10 years of chaos. So yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but I just wanted to say yeah, he was a bad guy. And then his his successors believed that he was as well. And and what he did in a lot of ways was was bad. And they came out and said it. So so we see um like we've talked about it before, how Mao would just kind of like label anyone who didn't agree with his brand of communism. He would label them as a revisionist and as a rightist. How were how are these guys like specifically uh, Liu Chao Chi and in the socialist education movement? How was he able to navigate like? getting things or at least trying to get things on the right track and not like piss Mao off too much. Well, like I said, he was, Mao was sidelined more or less on the administrative side, but Mao was working behind the scenes to consolidate power. Um, Liao Shaoqi made a few key mistakes. So during these, these four cleanups, this movement, he targeted specific areas like education, the military, the arts and culture uh, to go through and utilizing the the 10 points from Mao and that he revised in Xiaoping, he utilized that. He tried to implement those throughout those verticals, if you will. That's what we kind of call them in business, but those different verticals. He tried to go through that, but he made a couple of mistakes. There was one conference in 1964, I believe. There, uh, he had sent his wife before this out. To, he sent his own wife out to the countryside to work alongside the peasants and to also, quote, mentor them. And he got up in front of the CCP and a lot of these cadres and was like, you need to be like my wife. She's out there. You need to be like, and if you don't, you obviously have, you're obviously not part of the, you know, you're not part of the solution. You need to reconsider why you're part of the CCP. And like a bunch of people in the CCP were like, I don't like that at all. I don't like that. Yeah. You say your your wife, a woman, is better than me? Like what? That wasn't that was not kosher in in communist China at this point. Like absolutely not. So he made some mistakes like that, and it really just did not have. So like Mao believed that it needed to be. So Liao Shuqi, Xiao Qi, he believed it needed to be top down. Like I mentioned, intellectuals, young people move out to the countryside. You do the mentoring. Mao believed it needed to, just like the revolution had occurred before when he joined the CCP and was briefly part of the KMT. It needed to be this grassroots peasants uprising. Everybody from the bottom up needed to, because if you're going to have real change, real socialist change and revolution, you're going to ignite the socialist fervor, bottom needs to rise up. So Mao wanted to invigorate the youth and go right to them. So that's kind of where they differed. And that's what got Liao Shaoqi in trouble. But, you know, before that, it kind of started working in a sense. Part of the problem was Mao also had allies like Lin Biao, Lin Biao, who was the defense minister, probably Mao's most loyal. He was he was absolutely loyal, probably the most loyal member of the CCP to Mao. Anyway, within the military, so this is just an example of what the socialist education movement was doing. Within the military, he was like Mao's thought was taught every single day. Alongside military training, you had to do this ideological and philosophical training. You had to study and meditate on Mao, Mao's writings. He also kept a book of Mao's quotes, his most famous quotes, compiled them all into a little red book and distributed amongst the military. And then that filtered out into you know, the intellectual class and education where they had to start studying it in school. So they distributed this Maoist thought throughout these different cultural classes, so the military, education, intellectuals, all of that amongst Mao. And so he gained a lot of loyalty that way, especially from people like Lin Biao, who kind of undermined Liu Shaoqi. Like in the end, though, Mao's theory won out. You know, it's interesting looking at like what was going on in the military. It, it also occurred um, in other areas that started happening more to like 1965. But it was kind of these emulation campaigns where there's a he was a 21 year old Chinese soldier who died like a, it was like a telephone pole or telegraph pole, I guess at that point fell on him and killed him. So it was like this completely non heroic death and he volunteered, but it's not like he actually fought anybody. So he was this kind of new generation of communist Chinese, Chinese communist 
And he appealed to this younger generation of Chinese who had not experienced really the revolution. They weren't there during the Long March. They weren't there during the Shanghai Massacre. They weren't there really during World War II because they were they were too young to remember it really, or if they hadn't even been born. So Li Feng, when he died, on him they quote unquote found a diary. And I say that kind of tongue in cheek, they found a diary on him and it had nothing but praises for Mao and how wonderful and great Mao was. He was this leader, he was the steering wheel you know, if you're going to drive a car, you have to have a steering wheel and Mao is the steering wheel. He is the one that guides us and just these high praise. And he was later found out that it was almost completely fabricated from this, from the Chinese propagandists, but like, you know, it became super popular. Like they just started distributing it, like be like Li Fang, be like Li Fang. He is the new generation of Chinese communists. And this is who you need to be like. And that's how Mao got to the youth. So I think it initially started like, okay, we're going to go through and we're going to use these 10 points. We're going to go and try and reach these, you know, utilizing these, reach these people. And then it kind of became a fever pitch in favor of Mao. And then Mao just used that to turn into the cultural revolution. That was a really long way to say a lot of stuff happened in order to uh, turn Liao Shichi against it or Mao against Liao Shichi. No. Made sense to me. Yeah, I mean, by the time the um, like by the time nineteen sixty six rolled around and the Cultural Revolution, like um, like Liao Shaoqi, he was labeled a capitalist rotor, like a rotors. He was the, he he and Deng Xiaoping, they were both labeled. Uh, like it's funny, Lin Biao, who was like his most loyal. Um, member of the CCP like accused them of it and he like took their place but then Lin Biao fell out of favor with Mao Zedong and also died under suspicious circumstances so like cultural revolution as you know as we kind of wrap up this episode and start thinking about it the cultural revolution turned everyone against everyone it's not like it it's not like it took out specific enemies or had targets um it was just mass chaos think like the reign of terror during the french revolution so Nobody was safe. Nobody like hmm. Mao wanted it from a bottom up. So you had all of these peasants making accusation accusations. Then you had friends, you know, neighbors and turning on one another, friends turning on each other. You had the Red Guards, which were these youth this youth movement where these youths were taking control of schools and entertainment and arts. And they were so propagandized and they were so uh, militant pro Maoist that they just started to trying to take everything over and the military had to intervene, but then most of the military was caught up as a red guard. So you just had chaos. So even though um, Liu, Liu, Liu Xiaoqi was part of the CCP since its inception, just about same with Deng Xiaoping and he ended up succeeding Mao. They just were kind of victims of this kind of crazy time of the cultural revolution. Like nobody was safe and especially those at the top and had been there for too long. Because Mao started questioning them. He's like, I don't think you guys have been successful enough. I've got the power now. I've got power back. I don't think you guys have been successful enough. I think you have been going too slow. I think you're a capitalist rotor. And for that, you're going to be denounced and face a mm-hmm. struggle session and you know and all that. So interesting. It's interesting to hear like this hear about the dynamic like leading up to the Cultural Revolution because a lot of this happened in China like 10 years ago when when Xi Jinping had not quite like solidified power. We saw power sharing. Uh, Jiang Zemin, who just passed away, uh, played a role. Hu Jintao played a role. And now, 10 years later, in the in the present day, it's like the cultural revolution is going on in China again, except again. except different. There's, you know, I don't think there's as many, there's definitely not, you know, millions of people starving, but you, you know, you have the genocide going on with the Uyghurs up in Xinjiang and you just have this like rapid centralization of power where... Uh, a lot of the like mid-level bureaucrats, like, you know, provincial administrators, they, you know, if they don't do what they're supposed to be doing, they just up and disappear. So I say all that to say not to get too far into what our next episode is going to be. I just say like, it's, it's interesting to see like 
in the in what the four or five years in between the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, like these guys, I'm sure, like they tried to make things better, but what they really did was they just kind of like laid a foundation and gave Mao an excuse to have the Cultural Revolution. They literally, it's kind of like they were trying to avoid a fire, but they ended up just laying a bunch of firewood down and laying gas and handed Mao a bunch of matches. Be- yeah. Because yeah. like I mentioned, all of these things were slowly leading, not even really slowly, because it was a matter of what, four years till the Cultural Revolution. They basically put all of it in place for it to happen. Hey, we need to go after the youth movement. We need to reinvigorate socialism. Let's put a process in place to do it. So all Mao had to do is be like, I don't really like the way you're doing it. I'm just It's already starting. I'm just going to flip the switch. So it's bottom up instead of top down. And you know what's funny is like I would I would I'm willing to bet the people who kind of acquiesce to Xi Jinping taking over what was that 10 years ago now something like that it was 2012 2013 yeah it was 2012 yeah that that party congress in 2012 mm-hmm. that all those people were thinking to themselves this guy's going to make China great again he's going to you know, he's going to intimidate. We need a strong leader that can stand up to the West and the United States. This is the guy that under his leadership, like we're going to reunify the country and get Taiwan back. And the irony here is like you said, man, they're, they're laying the kindling down and, and they gave Xi Jinping a gas can. And like, I I don't have any reason to believe that COVID was like due to Xi Jinping's personal negligence. But, you know, whatever they were doing in Wuhan <laughs> led this, you know, this thing to, you know, to get out and come into existence. Uh, like, I'm sure he had, he knew something, you know, like, I'm sure he didn't direct it. Potential like, an the, opportunity may have presented itself. Like the face shot that China took globally, like China's super sensitive too. I, I only bring that up to say like, I'm willing to bet the very people who acquiesced and allowed or even so far as to put Xi Jinping in power, they're going to achieve the exact opposite in which they wanted to achieve in the same way that these people were like, no, Mao's the only guy that can lead us into the country. And then he got 10 years of chaos. Like it very much feels like we're on the precipice of a very chaotic period with China today. Yeah, and it, like that's why Jay. This is why I think it's important that we talk about it because it, the more you follow, like I, obviously we talked about the weather balloon. The weather balloon's happening. Everybody knows about it. We're seeing crazy YouTube and TikTok. And don't download TikTok unless you want to get spied on by the Chinese or you know Instagram Reels, whatever. We're seeing like all this social media of like, oh, there's the weather balloon and there's things like that. But there's also fairly accredited um, intel reports and like think tanks that are putting together war game situations for us going to war with China. And that's not like a cause for alarm necessarily because they've been doing it for decades, decades and decades. That's part of their job. But the fact that they're like, hey, if this happens in 2026, it's going to be disastrous on both sides. Like I think the last one by the... um, that we read out, it was like, it'd be kind of a Pyrrhic victory for the US. Like Taiwan wouldn't necessarily fall, but the losses would be super heavy. And you know, like if that happened, and I'm pretty sure uh, China believes that, the, and I think Russia is also in this camp too, that they believe the next world war would occur in 2035. I think that's kind of what they're planning toward. You know, there's a lot of different sources on that, but pretty positive 2035 is what their consensus is. So like we're, all of these things are happening and they're kind of funneling together. So that's part of the reason Jay and I like talking about the history behind the US and Chinese relations and just the histories of our countries kind of intertwined because it's going to be important to understand like, should something very bad happen? We need to understand who we're up against because even though this is not a kinetic war right now, like there is absolute conflict occurring like in cyberspace in the economy, on different like proxy countries, like 
like Joe Biden announced a couple weeks ago, like um, these aid packages to Africa. Like I hate to burst everybody's bubble. Like he didn't do that out of the kindness of his heart. He's doing that because Africa has turned into like basically a proxy continent for the US, Russians and Chinese, like to all compete against one another. And like, there's a lot of stuff we want here. Like we don't want the Chinese to get an Atlantic seaport in Africa. We don't want them to build this belt and roadway thing into Africa. We don't want them to exploit all these things. So like, there's Russians running around all these countries they shouldn't be in in Africa. So like we need to be cognizant that there is conflict occurring and understanding why the Chinese are acting a certain way is key. And you can't do that unless you understand what was going on 70 years ago, because it's going to set the tone. This cultural revolution is really going to sever ties between the, excuse me. It's just going to alter the way the Chinese communist party operates moving forward. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if this is where you were going, but you know, it's during the Cultural Revolution that we had the rapprochement with the United States. I was going to kind of go to that. Right? So, yeah, the the last five years of the Cultural Revolution were very different than the first couple. But yes, right. to your point that we had rapprochement. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, in our next episode, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. It, it, <laughs> I hope so. We may get there. The next episode or two or three, we'll get there. Yeah. It's funny. Jay and I always are like, yeah, well, this is the plan. It'll, it'll only take us two episodes. You know, we'll spend like three or four episodes on the U.S. economy and like 10 episodes later, we're only in like the <laughs> 1950s. Yeah, no, it's good. It's our episode. We, or it's our podcast. We can do what we want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just keep listening. No, in all seriousness, thanks, Colin. Uh, I... Again, that was that was a really interesting lead up to how the Cultural Revolution got started and the chaos that that unleashed upon China. It didn't just come from nowhere, right? Like it, it came from a series of blunders, a series of mistakes, a series of decisions meant by well-intentioned people trying to come out of the Great Leap Forward and, uh, you know, yeah. It's 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 important that we study these things not just for our own country but just to understand how China is somewhat going through similar things today. Like history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. That's what you like to say, Colin. So, <laughs> no, thank you. If you've if you've listened to us, we really appreciate the the listen. If you like this episode, click that click a subscribe button. Depending on what podcast uh, thing that you're listening to or on YouTube. But the best thing you can do is to give us a five-star rating and leave us a review. That goes a long way. I actually tried right before this episode. If you just leave a five-star rating, that's super helpful, and we definitely appreciate that. However, we can only give shout-outs to the people that leave reviews because we I can't see your I can't see your name if you only leave a, a rating. So like for example, we've got nine five star reviews on Apple Podcasts, and I tried really hard, folks. I can't see any of your names, but thank you to the nine people who gave us a five star review. <laughs> so, or, or yeah, five star rating. But yeah, if you leave us a review, we'll definitely give you a shout out here on the on the episode. And, uh, uh, and no, we uh, thanks again. You can if you have any constructive criticism or feedback for us we're on social media we're on twitter instagram facebook all some variation of loins of history and we look forward to continue talking about china and u.s relations in our next episode on the loins of history